Do you see Shazam yet? No, not yet. I've heard really good things. Oh, it's so good. Oh, it's my favorite thing. It's. Check it. Good evening, Mr. Newman. The Mission Impossible series has spanned six movies over more than 20 years. With each installment, they change style, cast, and characterization, tethered only by the continued presence of crews. Like the IMF, you are uniquely trained and highly motivated. We need someone to make sense of it all, and that someone will be you. Your team will be me, providing remote support if needed. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to continue this analysis of the Mission Impossible series, finding what makes it tick, the heart of it all. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. Kane! Oh god, don't blow up my hand, don't blow up my hand, don't blow up my hand, don't blow up my hand. Mission Impossible films go out of their way to entertain you. Even if you don't like the story, even if you think Ethan's hair is terrible in this one, looking at you, Mission Impossible 2. <sighs> even if you can't follow a single thing that's happening, it's still quite likely that you might respond, holy crap, I can't believe someone actually did that. At the center of that emotion is Tom Cruise. Up front, we aren't here to run through all the drama. But I am here to say that Tom Cruise has been Tom Cruise famous since Risky Business and Top Gun in 1983 and 1986, respectively. I can't really fathom being famous for 36 years on this earth, but not just famous, Tom Cruise famous. Which means a lot of the time you're creating news to stay in the news cycle for 36 straight years. That is a world I will never understand. He wants you to feel like your 10 bucks was amazingly well spent. I want to put this into perspective. Cruz was already a pilot of airplanes. It's a hobby of his, it's a thing. To make the ending of Fallout as impactful as possible, Cruz learned to fly a helicopter. But that's not even that impressive on its own. Here's the tea. He learned how to stunt fly a helicopter, which required about 2,000 flight hours to hit that level of mastery. He did that while they were filming. Some days he would do 16 hours of flight training and then go film the rest of the movie just to entertain you. One of the stunts doing a descending spiral through mountainous terrain is so difficult, a lot of master pilots wouldn't even attempt this. I'm not saying Tom Cruise hasn't put an awful lot of energy into things that a lot of people found harmful. But I am saying it's fascinating to watch him put his white hot cruise energy into attempting things that other actors generally don't. And it matters to the audience when you can tell that someone is actually doing the thing for real. The Burj Khalifa stunt is so bananas, I still bring it up on the reg. In a lot of ways, Mission Impossible is the story of Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise's Twitter bio reads, running in movies since 1981. Every actor runs at some point, but no one is known for running the way Cruz is. Yeah, he runs a lot, but he also runs better than every other actor in film history. Not faster, better. Tom Cruise is to running what Fred Astaire is to dancing. His greatest attribute as an actor has always been his focus. He locks onto a target, whether physical or abstract, and moves toward it with unwavering precision. 
and his running is a physical manifestation of that. His arms and legs pumping like pistons, his back rigid, his neck muscles tensed, every part of him focused on reaching his destination as fast as possible. His running reaches its peak in the Mission Impossible films. In several of them, namely 3, 4, and 6, there are sequences designed purely to allow crews to run, something with which no special effect can compete. In Fallout, Benji tells him to run faster, and we think, how is that even possible? And then somehow, he does it. The score crescendos, the camera struggles to keep up, and we realize we're watching a master at work. I'm coming to you, Patrick! I'm Tom Cruise! I'm just coming away here. It would be silly to pretend that these films were operating on a single grand plan bringing a single story to fruition over the course of multiple movies based on a single original idea. No one making Mission Impossible 1 could have possibly imagined where all this would be going. In a lot of ways, Mission Impossible movies are just a vehicle for whatever random stuff Tom Cruise is into at the time. I think MI2 better than any other movie illustrates what I'm talking about. This franchise is 1,000 times more consistent than it should be because of how these filmmakers chose to collaborate. The reason MI2 is important here is a lot of the tent poles of this franchise arrived in the second movie, where they were implemented as some sort of magic. Remember to pull the. Remember the I love the way MI3 makes sense out of some of the decisions John Woo made. Sorry, buried the lead. MI2 is the John Woo one. It essentially operates under the rules of, well, face off. You want to take his face? Yes. His face. Oh. Anyone could instantly transform into anyone else with their face and voice. The mask itself may have been an MI1, but I always loved the trade off in that movie. You could look like anyone, but you still sound like you. It's Cerebral, the way they implemented the masks. We'll see if you can follow me around the room. MI2 adds a never explained voice component where there is no trade off. And MI2 goes nuts with it. It's like a scroll invasion movie. And instead of just retconning it back out now that the balance was off, JJ Abrams took the time to figure out how the voice modulation was based on recording someone else's phonemes so that a voice print could be created algorithmically. It explained magic with science and made it take effort to pull it off. Having someone else's voice was no longer free. I'm saying they fixed the game design over time. MI2 doubled down on Ethan's desire to do everything the hardest, most acrobatic way possible. He'll undoubtedly engage in some aerobatic insanity before he'll risk harming a hair on a security guard's head. MI3 showed us the maniacal physics calculations that Ethan is doing all the time. Ethan started out a playboy dipshit superhero and the rest of the movies are trying to humanize this drastic sociopath and uncover his underlying humanity. Tom Cruise was into motorcycle stunts, so MI2 was about motorcycle stunts. Every movie after that incorporates these elements and improves on them. Ethan Hunt is still doing nutty motorcycle fights as late as MI5. But now these feel more in line with the world they've built. If I'm saying anything, it's that Mission Impossible is almost a franchise dead set on humanizing every John Woo-ass decision. MI2, for all of its perceived flaws, and I adore an awful lot of it all the same, puts up the scaffolding for the entire franchise, whether it made sense at the time or not. That's why Mission Impossible 2 kind of rules.
wander the neighborhood, a relic of a time long past, wondering, where do I belong? What happened to the silent film star? I'll answer that, but first we need to talk about production insurance. When you make a film, you need to have insurance should anything catastrophic happen that would put the production company in front of massive financial turbulence, in this case, Skydance, because we're going to talk about Ghost Protocol. In essence, if the star of your movie falls off the tallest building in the world, you don't have a movie and you have to recoup that loss. Enter the insurance company. Well, Tom wanted to run around on the side of the tallest building in the world and the insurance company said, Of course no, what is wrong with you? That's nuts, Tom. Jesus! To truly understand the reach of Tom Cruise, you need to understand how much the company insuring production has a say in how you make the film. If they say no, that's usually the ball game. Tom wanted to run down the side of the Burj Khalifa because he believed it would make an incredible moment in cinema history. He asked the production, which included Brad Bird, to fire the insurance company and find one that would insure the stunt. Silent film stars of days gone by didn't have to deal with this. And they did it. Tom Cruise fired an insurance company. I don't want to wax hyperbolic here, but that will probably never happen again for an actor for the rest of time who is not Tom Cruise. Where do we belong? They walk off into the sunset, born again in the crashing waves of modernity. I belong right here. Perhaps the silent film star had been reborn after all. Brad Bird made a movie about how the best technology in the world always has a chance to fail you. Okay, bye. See you next short film. Oh, I, I got... I need to say more? Mm, okay. It's a consistent theme in this movie from shore to shore. The prison is vulnerable to hacks. Hannaway's super technologically advanced contact lens is actually what kills him. The best technology in the world has design flaws. If you have to look at your phone to realize a warning, eh. The self-destruct method in Ethan's impossible mission brief doesn't go off, so he has to AC Slater it. The fancy hallway screen they use in the Kremlin that takes the subject view frustum into account is phenomenally cool. And it fails for exactly the reason you think it would. It's remarkably overdesigned and fails in the most delicate of use cases. Ethan's super cool and intriguingly fashionable jacket in the Kremlin scene, despite being the most basic of tech, still fails. This is a movie about failing. I, this one doesn't even... They put a retina scan on the side of a highly mobile train. Kind of speaks for itself on that one. Dubai is a head-to-toe fail. The face mask printer fails. Ethan has to climb on the outside of the tallest building in the world because he can't hack the server without direct access. Then his gloves fail. Twice. Also this. We were unprepared in the dark. And the only thing that functioned properly on that mission this team. It's a movie about what we take for granted. This is so true that in the climax, Benji is making Cat 5 cable with his bare hands, which quickly become bloody. Or more succinctly, the movie illustrates that sometimes we value technology over people, even though we shouldn't. Ghost Protocol's worth another watch. I mean, Brad made the Iron Giant, that's gotta be worth something. If you ever want to feel bad about where you are in your life, 
Remember that Christopher McQuarrie won the Best Original Screenplay Oscar for The Usual Suspects before he turned 30. Five years later, he made his directorial debut with The Way of the Gun, which utterly bombed at the box office and seemed to kill his career right as it was supposed to be taking off. He didn't have another credit for eight years. Until Valkyrie, the project where he met Tom Cruise. Something happened here. I guess their tastes and storytelling sensibilities meshed because from then on, Macquarie became Cruise's go-to guy, the writer he would bring in to save projects that needed some help. Sometimes that would result in a masterpiece, like Edge of Tomorrow, and sometimes... <coughs> the project was just beyond saving. But this was a creative partnership that resulted in nine movies in almost as many years. While Mission Impossible was once about bringing in great directors to reinvent the series, with Macquarie, we saw him develop into a great director through Mission Impossible. He's talked openly about how he starts production on his mission films with only about 30 pages of script written, figuring out the story on the job with the pressure of needing to write scenes that he'll be shooting just days later. He compares the experience of making a Mission Impossible movie to what the characters in it are going through. The crew and the cast lay out a plan, some of it goes wrong, they adapt, things get intense, but in the end, they pull it off. And I think this might be why Macquarie is the perfect director for these movies, and why he can't stop coming back. Like, Ethan Hunt is addicted to the job, and Cruise is obsessed with pushing himself and the series to new heights, Macquarie seems just as addicted to the insane challenge of making these movies. Ghost Protocol set the tone and approach for the series going forward, but it also did so behind the scenes. Cruise and Macquarie have become the foundation of the Mission Impossible team. They're like Ethan and Luther, or Ethan and Benji, or maybe more accurately, Ethan and Ilsa. They're equal partners, perfectly in sync, totally trusting of one another. This partnership is the core of the series now. As much as Mission Impossible was once an anthology series defined by the variety of directors, it has now become the defining work of one of modern cinema's great creative partnerships. Is that a little hyperbolic? Yes, but I stand by it. Rogue Nation, the directorial debut of the Macquarie Ara, Macquarie Era, Marinera, Marino Hera, Yogi Berra. Okay, shit, I think I accidentally just cast a spell. Hang on. Rogue Nation is the glue of the Mission Impossible franchise. It reaches all the way back to the original film and gives context for how far we've come. Mr. Chairman, the so-called Impossible Mission Force is not just a rogue organization. It is an outdated one to an era without transparency and without oversight. No organization could really survive Ethan Hunt, and to be fair, he commits treason once every 54 seconds. Okay. Is the Syndicate the Rogue Nation? Or is it actually Ethan? Whoa! It incorporates all of the films in clever ways. It brings in refreshing new plots as well. It ties everything up so that the follow-up Fallout could basically just go for broke from moment one. Which culminates with the single loose plot thread that has been dangling since Mission Impossible 3. Julia. You really have to see Rogue Nation and Fallout as the package that they are. Ethan's choices have consequences and he must confront them or he'll never grow. But he's still Ethan. It glues the older franchise era to this new era and hang on for the ride. Mission Impossible Rogue Nation is when Christopher McQuarrie took the reins of the franchise from those that came before him. But they're still around, J.J. Abrams is still around, these are still bad robot movies, there's an ever-expanding team of people that keeps showing up over and over and over, you know, like Mission Impossible movies. But they built a team, took their positions, and here we are. They tried so many things, made more good decisions than bad ones, got to movie 5, locked in, and said, alright, we got it, that's the team. I'm finding very few ways not to hyperbolize how cool it is that the Mission Impossible movies are personified by the people making them. Imagine what it must be like to go into work every day and never be bored. You can make a list of everything you've ever wanted to see in a movie and just strap Tom Cruise to an actual plane and loft him across the billowing sky. I have no doubt that it is stressful as all get out, but what a job. I don't want to put too fine a point on this, but these movies are about a team of people working together to accomplish something that a single auteur, regardless of talent, 
could not. There is a team. Rogue Nation is the glue. I mean, after Ghost Protocol, the moment someone decided these movies didn't need numbers anymore, I was starting to get the feeling that these films were winding down. And I know I'm not the only one that felt that. Rogue Nation made me believe that they may never wind down. I'm sure sometimes it feels unreasonable to film and choreograph scenes in the hardest possible way. You can tell all of the people behind the camera care about these movies just as much as the people in front of them. That's rare for that to exist at this level. Rogue Nation is made of glue. When I think of Mission Impossible movies, the first word I think of is collaboration. Every movie is about working with a team, both good and bad. The first movie is about a failure to collaborate. This episode is a collaboration with Patrick and one that I had a blast with. Also, that's pretty meta. I just want to be clear that I think what is happening right now is a very big deal. Film history is going to remember this series because what is film history if it does not recognize joy? I cannot believe this goofy ass thing still exists. Can you imagine if there were five bulletproof sequels? This was a modern movie based on a 60s TV show. I don't have to spell that out. How can you not respect the hustle of this franchise? It's survived everything. These movies are a wonderful collaboration based on accepting whatever the creator that went before you thought was cool. I love it when the underdog rolls with the punches long enough that it becomes number one and it doesn't even know how it got there. How many franchises go John Woo that early and then go the distance? Like, I'll wait. I guess what I'm saying is healthy collaboration is good. Actually, good morning, Mr. Willems. But before you go, go subscribe to Patrick Willems. There's a card right there. Just click that card. I love his content and I love his energy. We found out we had this mutual love of Mission Impossible movies because they are a great deal more than they appear to be on the surface. Now go subscribe to Patrick. Oh, and check out his Paddington videos. They make me feel all warm and stuff. Okay, bye. <laughs> oh, hello again. As, as we reach the end of our journey through, or possibly not. Hey, go watch, go watch Patrick's video if you haven't already. That's in order. I'm in that one too, and. And we had it. we're just being real good friends and having lots of fun, like Jay Stoll and Ernest Baum and the Vita Activa and Death Star in Space. Com. Where else would there be a Death Star? Um, hi, please subscribe to the Patreon uh, if you want to get your name in these credits. It is the Pretzel tier for cool people like Brian Johnson, Jay Wants a Cat, Tobias Hodges, Character Select, Sabrina Gonzalez. Adam Mick, Adam Muto, Franz Plants, Fran, Franz Plants. Watch out for all the Franz. They're planning. Um, so we just did a monster collaboration. I've never done anything like that before. That was intense. Uh, but part of it is because I think me and Patrick have the same sort of mania about entertaining people. Although Teenage Sex Draculas is back very pleased to see that back um innocuous and acronym i get i get so distracted by your names i love it like i have to say stuff and you guys just you write the cleanest most hilarious bullshit uh so we did a collaboration and we've been talking about it for quite a bit of 2019 actually um trying to find the right window and realized april would be that window and it kind of came down to like we both made these videos in one week. Um, writing, editing, shooting, directing. Like, it was mad. And, like, Patrick is... He's the right kind of mad. Because um, I was right there. Like, man, we really we really pushed it to get these done. And I think they're really cool. And I'm happy we did it. And I think that we both realized why we set impossible demands on ourselves. Because... 
That's what the filmmakers of Mission Impossible do. And we found that really, I don't know, comforting? Um, also comforting is hashtag woke vampires versus swear wolves. Look at all these fine people. I can't even like say, I am so tired. <laughs> we haven't slept in a week, essentially. Uh, but Henry Kropf has Kelly Naylor and Richard Scott and Adam Thomas, Trey Warren, Ray Johnson, Patrick Mahoney, Brad Hunziker, Walrus. I had, to, I had to give a good walrus. Kevin Hochter, Garrett Lathy, Cyclops, Boy, Jacob Koziel, M Map. Love you all. Go to patreon.com slash movies and Mikey. Bye. Watch Patrick's video.